address, well, I've done it, it's an address, and I know that's what other people have as well. So this is an Educature style presentation, but really it's about brevity and about just giving some little um, bits of inspiration for you um, to be um, thinking about and to get us going for the day. So I'm going to hand over to Roz, who's going to facilitate uh, this session. Thank you. Um, so we're going to learn um, about really inspiring um, and exciting and sometimes <coughs> new um, examples of people-driven digital. We're going to do six um, uh, now and six later on. Um, you can see over here the names of the people and the, the um, organisations that are involved. And you'll see that there's Twitter um, uh, uh, handles on there. So please do feel free to give positive feedback and share what, we, what you're learning. Um, online, so we're actually getting this, this event out there to the people who weren't able to make it today. So, six, six pitches, um, five minutes each, and five slides. And at the end of each pitch, will be a chance for you to um, have two minutes to reflect on what you've just learned. Um, and we'd really like you to um, both learn and also share as well. So, on the table, there's, um, there's cards that look like this. Um, if you have any particular sort of, um, insight or positive feedback or connection to make with, with, the, with the person who's spoken, please write it on these cards. And then on your table is also envelopes. So if you could label um, an envelope for um, the person and, and put your comments in, in there. And we're going to make this private feedback. So this is between you and, and those people. And then at the end, if you either will walk around with this box or if you can put your envelopes in here, I will make sure that those comments get back to the, those people. So um, Kelly's going to um, do the timing for us and be really sharp on that. So make sure everybody who's speaking, you are sticking to your five minutes. I think you don't have to do it one minute per slide, so that, that's up to you. You're, you're responsible for moving your slide along, so we'll leave that in your hands. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll start with Hannah. Okay. So I'll hand you the microphone and also you'll have the Lovely, thank you. Um I'm just gonna set my timer so I know what I'm doing. You can go for started. I've started. Um, my name is Hannah Chamberlain and I'm here to talk to you about mental snap. Um, mental Snap is a video diary service for mental health service users, but actually we're thinking uh, what we want to do is to phrase it beyond that, it's for people who are actively managing their mental health. And um, the reason it came about, I've been working in mental health and film for 18 years, and um, I had a, a, a strong idea about how people respond to the opportunity to tell their story on film. And I've seen people tell their story on film, and I've seen the transformation that it can, that it can bring about simply through the listening um, ear and the seeing eye of the camera, knowing that you told your story, knowing that you've been heard, and having that opportunity to take the pen back from the psychiatrist. There's a ledger this thick on you, and I'd like to tell my own story. So, uh, so having had these 18 years worth of um, uh, uh, working in film and mental health specifically, we took this idea of video diaries and we took it to people and we did a whole load of market research. My initial idea was that people would want to automatically add the video to their electronic health record and actually what we found out is they didn't. And that has been a huge learning curve for me in that we stripped out, we took the model and we, we, we researched it for a year, we, um, we've looked at it, we've shaken it up and down, Mark's been on the advisory board, I've been talking to Victoria, I've talked to Andre, there's, there's um, a lot of people have been involved in the development of this project. And, and at the last advisory board meeting we stripped out the idea that you share the video with your clinician or that you share the video full stop. And um, what this has done is it's moved us from a medical model, I didn't realise I was stuck in the medical model, but simply by saying you want to show the video to your clinician, I was. We've now moved it much more to a social model, and it's the individual in charge of their story uh, in their community. And what I'm thinking about is things like open dialogue, um, I'm really interested in 
the, the ideas that are coming out at the moment about post-truth and how that applies to health. Um, and the fact that emotional truth is as important as objective truth. And I think if we can look at things holistically, we'll, we'll have a, a really strong um, route going forward. So to get back to my slides, we're developing it by the mental health service users for mental health service users, and it doesn't subscribe to the medical model. And I think there's a real consumer appetite for this. Um, it, it's it's um, using resources that you already have available to you, so your camera can be the therapist in your pocket. And what I'd like to say, and where I'd like to leave it, and I've actually been very short, um, what I'd like to say is that if you take the ability to tell your story, then we can move to something that is much more person-centred, and much more about the individual in community, and we're going to have an online community to support Mental Snack. Um, but it's to do with peer support. And what I hope is that we can move towards a more holistic way of looking at mental health. I don't want to have my records told to me by a psychiatrist. I don't want to have a ledger on me that is written by somebody else that I don't agree with. And I don't want that to be my legacy. I want um, to leave a legacy where people and their ability to tell their stories is empowering and me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That's brilliant. Social, peer support, and digital, all of those things. That's something that's certainly resonate with me anyway, so it's brilliant. So we've now got two minutes to reflect on what you've heard from Hannah and hopefully to share some of your insights, connections, ideas, and feedback on, on these comments.
Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so my name is Simon Bird, um, and I'm a manager in FE College in West Yorkshire. So um, I'm also a mum, so I've got four daughters, and um, not surprisingly, then have an interest in uh, women's health, and particularly in matern maternity health and maternity services. Uh, so I've been working since uh, 2011 with uh, women migrants who have low levels of English to help improve their access to maternity services. So just to be clear, I'm a teacher, I'm not a techie. Uh, so if you've got an invisible idea, what I'm hoping I'll be able to tell you today is some of the ways to avoid the, pit avoid the pitfalls um, that technology can bring with them. And if you're a tech person, then maybe you'll get a little bit of an insight into how people who have great ideas don't necessarily understand the technology and need the helping hand on the way. Okay, so I have an app. Um, it helps people to learn English within the context of pregnancy and birth and seeks to empower women to become active participants in their care. Okay. So, the background. The evidence shows that outcomes of women and their babies are not equal, so BME women experience poorer outcomes, such as increased maternal death uh, than other groups, and their babies are at greater risk of dying within the first, before their first birthday. And not speaking English is a factor, uh, is a risk factor for women. So, and, and funding to support women is often short term and insufficient. So, I worked on projects, you get two, you get three, maybe four years funding. We've got a project running at the moment which actually has eight years funding, but that's quite unusual. Quite unusual sorry. Uh, so, the app, developing an app seemed to me like a good idea of um, a way of providing sustainability to a project that's quite short term. So the app that, um, that, we, that I developed includes, it uses images and uses the spoken words. So it's very, very simple. It, you press on one of, the, uh, one of the images down the side. So for example, press on blood test, it will take you to a screen here of somebody having a blood test. And if, they, uh, if the patient were to press the button here, blood test, it will speak, it will say that for them. A lot of the women I'm working with don't, um, don't read or write in their own language and maybe, you know, and then of course not even. <coughs> So it's very much a focus on the spoken word. And then we look at the context within, um, within which that language might be used. So clicking on the midwife button, and it will give you some example phrases or examples of where a midwife might use that phrase when speaking to a woman in the uh, maternity unit. And click on the you button, and it will give you some phrases that you might say, things you might want to ask, things you might want to say. And again, all of those speak. So you press the button and they speak to you. So the app developed out the set of picture cards that I, uh, that I produced for the program that I was working on at the time, East Hall for Presidency. And I developed those in collaboration with the midwives at the uh, Women and Newborn Unit at BRI in Bradford. And so I consulted with them. I went into the hospital, I watched them um, take doing consultations with women who didn't, who didn't speak English. I listened to the language that they, that they used. I looked at the kind of procedures that they went through and I photographed those and, um, and fed them back then to the women. So I went back to the midwives, showed them what I got, said, you know, how does this represent what you're doing? Is this, you know, is this correct? Am I helping women? Am I preparing them well for accessing your services? So I had involvement from the midwives. Um, in this process. Unfortunately then the, um, the app, it was an afterthought for the project. It was kind of a right, the project's coming to an end, what do we do now? And so it became um, something that happened very, very quickly. So I, I relate my development of the app very much to sort of an unplanned pregnancy, I suppose. Um, <laughs> the, the relationship with my app developer was, short, was very brief. It was, very brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, it was rather disappointing. <laughs> Um, on that journey. Um, the time that it took me to develop the app and the time it took us to produce it together was much more than I expected. Every time the little thing I asked them to do took forever. Um, the Apple version was out quite quickly. Two years on, I'm still waiting for the final bits of the Android version to be sorted and that's frustrating. It cost me far more. It, it didn't cost a huge amount at the time. It's probably cost me a lot in my time since. And um, everything that you want changing, everything you want them to do for you costs money. Lots of the things they promised me, they suggested to me, then or they're not, they're not actually within the quotes. Wasn't in the small print because there was no small print. My contract said this amount of money, this job, that's it. It was very, very brief. 
Um, and that's caused me issues with planning for the future. So there's loads I want to do now. It was a perfectly formed, beautiful little app when it came out. It's now very simple. Um, so it causes me issues to do with where I go forward. Right, top tips if you're thinking of developing an app. Have a clear vision. Don't let someone tell you that you can't do it. Don't let the app developer tell you it's not possible. And make sure that you collaborate. I worked with the midwives. I didn't have time to market test. That's a real issue. So I'm going back and doing that retrospectively. You need critical friends who will tell you all the mistakes that you're going to make before you make them so you don't make them. And make sure it's all down, written down in a contract. And always make sure you've got some money held back because you will want to change things. You'll want to move it forward. You'll want to make it better. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, I think that's really um, good advice for the people, so thank you for sharing that. And I thought it was quite interesting how this is a completely different sort of subject area to the last one, but there is some common themes in there around um, listening and about building relationships and using technology to do that. So now you've got two minutes to chat amongst yourselves and also sort of hopefully put together some ideas and insights and feedback for Diana. about this is that it's not been a short process. 
Um, the commercial review was published in 2011, but it wasn't until 2014 where we were brought on board as a partner because of the, um, the, the idea of creation that a digital tool would help this. We carried out most of the design and development in 2015, and then this year has been spent really making refinements to that um, and we're currently taking the, the app through the scene marking process um, and who knows what MHRA will come back with there. So we, that might be until 2017 at this rate. Um, but the important thing is that we've had clinical, clinical involvement from day one and I think that has made a significant difference to the way in which this project has been run. Um, we've been working with the people on the ground, junior doctors, consultant haematologists, transfusion practitioners, quality leads, and the technical lead for NHS blood and transplant. And they've really driven the project. They've determined the functionality. Um, they've helped us work through the different care pathways. And to the point where this is the kind of flow chart for, that's not, not supposed to be animating, but um, this is the flow chart for the process that we're working through at the moment. Um, and this is on the 19th major version now, and there's been four times that many minor versions. So they've really helped work through the actual process of what we're trying to create here. And by having um, the ambassadors that worked originally on the project, we're going to have advocates for this app that will help us support adoption when we actually roll this out, hopefully next year. It's not been an easy process. Um, and the main barriers to this have really been um, about the healthcare professionals themselves. They are very busy people and getting them involved in day-to-day -day activities and getting feedback from them has been near, near on impossible, um, which meant that this project has taken two years. In the commercial world, this probably would have taken six months. Um, so that's really kind of caused quite a few delays. But they've been an absolutely fantastically strong team and we've had the support from the very, from day one, um, continuity, which shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and we've also had a really strong facilitator who is really passionate about the project and understands that the process of creating something of this nature isn't about creating it and then validating it. It's about understanding the needs of the people that are using it on the ground and taking that forward through the design process. So if I have one um, piece of advice in terms of the co-creation process, um, it would be to listen. Um, so we, um, as a design agency, we are often seen as experts in our field and have to go into a room and consult, um, and that really isn't what we have to do as part of the co-creation process, we have to facilitate. Um, we're not the experts in the room anymore, and the most valuable opinions um, requests and learnings have come from the people that are actually going to be using this um, from day one. So we've learned to, to leave our egos at the door um, and go and sit and listen um, and really make sure that we're not um, creating a solution before we've heard what everybody's got to say. Loud and clear there, then. <laughs> um, but also, I thought there was another message in there, and that's about um, engaging clinicians and also understanding the barriers around that. And um, the idea of people as champions and, and helping you adopt innovation. And, all, and I think that, that sort of reflected some of Emma Chester's um, contribution last night in the Google Innovation Day. <laughs> right, so we've got two minutes to talk amongst yourselves and, um, and give some feedback for.
don't rush him when I was back in. Without being able to use cookies or anything 
clever or technological. <coughs> we just use a smart idea and a very, very simple bit of online marketing. So there's absolutely no doubt uh, in my mind that it works. Um, so this has now become part of the national project. But what is the project? You know, social media marketing is out there, isn't it? Facebook exists, I believe. At least it was there when I checked this morning. Um, so does Twitter. So what I'm doing now, actually, is trying to convince my peers around the country that they might try this too. So if you go onto my LinkedIn page, you'll find a series of blog posts. And that's what the project has become. Wandering around the country, trying to convince people to do something that's really, really easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, and then the time as well, fantastic. Um, that's really interesting because we were talking about Google Innovation yesterday and, um, and there was sort of some talk about the system sort of putting in barriers, but you know, you're coming in from NIHR and using Google Innovation and sort of getting it in there, so brilliant. Um, so, we have two minutes to um, write, uh, talk amongst yourselves and write your feedback on your postcards. Um, what I should have also said is that uh, we're going to be writing up a report specifically about the Petra Future speeches, so we'll be capturing a lot of this information and the slides and that kind of thing in a report and sending that out afterwards. Collaboration between the Department of Nursing at Manchester Met 
as a patient participation group uh, in Hyde. Uh, Tensai, as some of you may well know, have some of the lowest health outcomes uh, in the country. And um, the Tenside Health and Wellbeing Strategy has really tried to um, get people uh, in the local communities involved, volunteer services, etc., involved in um, empowering um, individuals to actually take responsibility for their own health. And the Patient Participation Group in Hyde is really, really proactive in trying to create solutions to, to support the local community. So this is the health budget team, um, and um, you can see myself and Ingrid and Dominic uh, Sexton, who is the um, current secretary of the Thorny House Patient Participation Group. Um, one of the problems within the PPG is um, trying to get people into the group to meet. Um, generally, people like myself who work full time can't take time off at half past one on a Thursday afternoon to attend PPG meetings. So um, there was quite a lot of people in the practice quite keen on doing things, so we decided to set up sort of splinter groups and set up working groups that we could work on things. Um, and we looked at the skills that we've got in the group, and we happen to have John Nick, who's a web designer. So we thought, oh, well, we might be able to do something <coughs> that will engage the local community. So we, we talked to John Nick, and John Nick said, well, we could set up a website, um, and then we could start get, getting people to pledge. So we set up the Health and Edge website um, and then we started going out and um, engaging with community groups, schools, brownies, um, the local Bangladeshi uh, women's group and then we got my students on board. So Department of Nursing at Manchester Met. Hello. Uh, Department of um, essentially we wanted to um, upskill the student nurses in terms of health prevention, health promotion. Um, for those of you who probably don't know, there's a massive crisis with placements in, in uh, nurse training. Um, we want to move the, the curriculum into the community and, and provide more community focused um, training for student nurses, but the placements just aren't there. So we've been trying to come up with creative solutions that will allow the students to engage with the community in different ways. And this provides us an ideal opportunity to get the students to promote Health Pledge and use Health Pledge to initiate conversations in the local community. Um, trying to address some of the poor outcomes, things like um, a third of people that die in Tameside is from heart disease or obesity related diseases. Um, Tenside also has some of the highest rates of smoking, obesity and diabetes in the country. So really, um, trying to get the students out there engaging with people before they actually were sick in hospital um, and using Health Pledge to do that. So you can see the website, um, we have sections where you can go on, you can register, you don't have to register, you don't have to, you can do it anonymously and you can build your Health Pledges. Um, we also go out to schools and other local community groups, take the health pledge slips and then we go back um, and put them onto the website. So we get them thinking about small things. So my health pledge um, was to stop using the lift. And we were just moving into a new building and it had glass lifts and I am absolutely terrified of glass lifts. So I have not used the lift in the three years we've been in that building and I lost a stone in a year just through walking up four flights of stairs probably three or four times a day. So small, small things can make massive differences and that's what we're basically trying to um, promote. The added value of this is giving our students the opportunity to engage with the local community. This was last week, self-care week. We support a patient group in Hyde every year with self-care week. So the patients from the patient group come down, work with our students in Morrisons in Hyde, and we use the health pledge um, leaflets to start conversations with local people about addressing weight issues, we take blood pressures, um, and we um, give them health and advice. We spent a lot of time last week talking to older people who were very lonely, uh, who generally go to, to Morrisons for their uh, meals, city, city, city Morrisons, uh, waiting for people to talk to them. <coughs> Added benefits. Um, we launched this website um, on January 1st, 2015, as a big bang from the point of view of, of the uh, 
um, and making a big difference to your health. Um, the uh, patient participation group were named best, best patient participation group in the country this year and won the Paul Kill Award. And the nursing team at Manchester Met um, won the best free reg provider this year, um, primarily due to the collaboration. Just some quick tips. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really time. It's really time. Okay, it's fine. She's hard on me. I'll just leave that slide there so you can have a quick look through there. Um, well, uh, um, say thank you. Can we all say thank you very much? I've known about the health pledge for a while now, and it's really brilliant to hear how it's sort of expanded and gone on. And um, also, I think what you show us is the sort of power of. Um, people, individuals and groups of people who are really trying to change, I think. And people who are um, quite what's called bridge builders, so you can build across communities and um, different sectors. So that's brilliant. So, two minutes to uh, write down your reflections and ideas and feedback for, for um, Jackie and Ingrid and Co. Uh, uh.
one in four or more of us will experience a mental health problem at some point in our lives, and it doesn't single us out or make us different. But the way society treats these conditions and experiences often leads to stigma. As a service user, you are a patient in a top-down system, a system which knows best. This disempowering model can exacerbate mental illness. Who really knows best? We believe people who live with mental health conditions know best about what's best for people with mental health conditions. Sheffield Flourish was co-produced from its very foundations for this reason. We are a community of storytelling, social networks, skills workshops, creative meetups, and more. So this is a quote from our chair. The concept of Sheffield Flourish was co-produced by a charity board, including people living with mental health conditions. So it was co-produced from its very conception. It wasn't an afterthought, which can happen and isn't quite right. I had an interesting conversation with someone yesterday who said, um, you should be prepared to, when you go into a co-production process, to even question what the problem is that you're solving. And I think that's really important. Um, over 180 people have been involved in Sheffield Farish from before the launch. So that means that we have a group of ambassadors. Somebody else mentioned that earlier. You have, if you have this group of people involved before you even start, then they're with you through to the end. So when you launch, you have these people already engaged, which is fantastic. And um, finally, we have representation at every level. So from our board to our staff to our volunteers, we have people living with mental health conditions who are bringing insight and ideas. So at the moment, we have over 40 volunteers, and, and that and they are involved in all the processes that we do through our organisation. So we have a steering group, and some of our steering group in this room today. Um, we have an editing panel who um, look at the stories that we're writing and the content that we write and make sure that it's all appropriate, that we're going in the right direction. We have digital ambassadors who go out to the community and tell people about what we do and help them get online. And we have creative content producers who create stories about themselves and about the community. So every level, which I think is really important. And that's a little graphic to show what I just said. Co-production doesn't just bring our community value, it is our community's value. So first of all, it keeps us on the right track. We know that what we're doing has value. We know that we're going in the right direction. Quite often, I find myself realising that I maybe was slightly off point when I have a conversation with somebody and they just get me in the right direction and that's so useful. Um, the other thing is different perspectives lead to a better overall solution. So you can't be a devil's advocate for yourself. You can't think of all the different perspectives on your own. When you're in a room with people, and um, when I'm in a room with the editing panel that we have, they bring all these ideas that I couldn't even imagine, and we find a solution together, which is a really great process. Um, and I think the really important thing here is the co-production process itself is empowering. So the process creates a stronger, more skilled up community. You learn skills through cooperation, um, and it's, it's a really beautiful thing to see. So there are a couple of barriers, um, which I think are most memorable. Firstly, you, when you're doing co-production and you're inviting everyone to bring their ideas, you can get a lot of ideas. And if it's a digital project, you want the final project to be lean. If you make a website with all these different widgets or plugins, then it can be unhelpful. So you need to make sure, so you can't include all the ideas. Secondly, there's not enough time for all the enthusiasm you can get from people. But it's an incredibly rewarding process and um, the resources that you do get outweigh any of the problems that you face. So I just wanted to end by showing a really nice quote from someone from our community, um, which I thought was really summed up what I'm saying. I think it's important to make the community feel valued and you have to work out what matters to people. So for some people, it's saying thank you. For other people, 
you can thank them in other ways. So one of the people we work with likes to be paid in cheese. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I think the quote here hanging because it's really important, I think, and very relevant to all of our work. So, two minutes to um, think about and talk about what uh, Joe's, Joe's has shared with us, and um, please do write in your insights or ideas or connections on the, on the little cards and put them in the envelopes.